Welcome to the Say Network Podcast. I'm Megan Vialpando, and I'm here with Jim Sparks. Hello. And Abraham Guevara. Hello. We have a really great episode for you guys today. This is actually our final, final episode of season two. I can't believe we are done with season two already. Done. Um, For this episode, we wanted to discuss a topic that seems to be generating a lot of awareness in the church right now, which is special needs ministry. We hear a lot about it, and um, we just want to talk about how we in the Salvation Army, how we're currently ministering to families with special needs, and also look at how maybe we could do this better. And so over the past year, Abraham and Heather have actually um, set out to learn more about special needs and how we can improve kind of our ministry um, to those with special needs within our Salvation Army context. So this episode's actually dedicated just to learning more about their experience. And also, um, we're going to talk more about this uh, a special video series project, um, which will be launching soon, um, that they've created to help youth leaders and core officers in, in the area of special needs. So before we get into the episode, we just want to take a minute and talk about a youth culture resource with you. So Jim, what do you have? Um, I am bringing the 10 Spotlight back. Um, the 10 Spotlight was a newsletter I created, uh, man, pretty early on. I don't know like how soon when I started working at THQ, but uh, a lot of it was stemmed from, uh, if you've ever seen my browser uh, bookmarks, and uh, there, uh, there's a lot, uh, hundreds of bookmarks, and it was all about youth culture stuff. And so as I learned, I thought, well, I should be sharing some of this stuff. And so I created the 10 Spotlight newsletter and I did it for many, many years. And then uh, uh, as my job changed, I kind of ran out of steam on it. And so it's been many years. I don't even know when the last one I put out. I think it might have been eight to 10 years ago. I don't know. I don't know, I've been here a long time, but uh, it's back nonetheless. And um, what it does is it highlights different youth culture pieces, uh, stories, Salvation Army stories. It gives free resources, uh, any of the good stuff that I could find that I think youth workers could use. Uh, I'm not going to give anything that I don't think they could use, um, but the the spectrum is pretty wide. It could be anything, again, from freebies. Uh, this, this one that's going out tomorrow morning has uh, a whole host of freebies, and it's got some cool... Um, culture pieces as well and uh yeah so uh it's back it, it'll come every friday morning for your reading enjoyment right awesome be on the lookout for 10 spotlight well you already released one already right i did and it was amazing well i don't know if it was amazing but and then when will the next one be out tomorrow morning tomorrow morning it- Tomorrow yep. morning. It will land in your inbox at 6 o'clock a.m. every Friday morning. Well, P.S. Pacific Standard Time. So I just want to take a minute and introduce Heather. I guess you're familiar with Heather. Heather's been on a recent episode, actually this last week's episode, when we talked about our favorite youth group ideas. Um, Heather works in the youth department, and she coordinates all of our, our events, logistics. Um, but aside from that, she also had the opportunity to work on um, a, a special project. And so, Heather, can you tell just tell us a little bit more about um, what inspired you to do this project? How did you get started with this project? Just a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, just over a year ago now, uh, we... Uh, we sat down a few of us in the department and kind of talked about things that um, we could do to work better with the field. And we recognize that as youth workers, uh, we still need training and ongoing development. And in the past, we used to be able to have boot camp, but we haven't had that for a while. But the need was still there to still get that training um, and that understanding. And so how can we use what we do have rather than kind of be hindered by what we don't have? And um, so in the meantime, until we're able to kind of bring back that type of event, we wanted to see how we could still engage and learn and teach and work together with the field. And so we brainstormed some ideas. And at the time, I definitely didn't understand the size of the project. And so I looked at just 
hot topics and things that would work um, with youth worker development and leadership training. And so I had this big master list of like 10 to 12 things, and we were going to do something every single month. But when I uh, started to sit down and do research, looking at, um, you know, working with a small budget or uh, multicultural ministries, I then got to the special needs, working with special needs families. And when I sat down with some of the others and talked to some of the parents, I recognized that this was a topic that deserved far more than just one month. And it was overwhelming, really. Like the weight of what the church is being asked to do is is massive. And so I really wouldn't be able to do it justice in a month. And so from there, I was talking to Abraham on how this could develop, what it looked like, and it turned into a full year project and an actual video series. And everything else could wait because this issue was so pressing, um, especially in the Salvation Army, because I think we're in a position and we're poised to make a bigger impact because a majority of the church isn't. And so we're, we're kind of in this place where we're having them come into us and we're having this access to them that we're not able to fully capitalize on. Heather, you mentioned the, the Salvation Army is uniquely poised to make a large impact within the special needs community. Uh, what do you mean by that? Um, so when I was sitting down with, the, with families of special needs children and was really digging into what life is like for them and what it is to have a special need and engage with uh, society on the whole, um, I learned a lot that I didn't realize. And one of the things that we, I discovered was that a significant um, portion of the families actually live below uh, the poverty line or live with a lower income because of the demands on their family financially. They, um, a lot of them are single income due to one parent needing to stay home to manage appointments, therapies, and different things like that and their child's needs. And, or... Um, on the other side of that, there's a lot of them that are single income because the divorce rate for families is a lot higher than what it is for non-special needs families. And so just the added stressors on them uh, leads more marriages to end in divorce when they have a special needs child. So we have more single parents who have children that they're raising but then have the higher financial demands. And the Salvation Army through its social service programs and just our desire to serve a marginalized community. Well, that's the marginalized community is the special needs community. And so they're coming through our doors trying to get resources. And we may not see it because we're seeing a parent come in or an aunt or a grandma, and we're not seeing the child with the need, um, but the families are afflicted with it and they have uh, that need. And we are meeting some of their financial needs or through food pantries or things like that. Uh, but we, then have an opportunity to bridge them over to the church and meet their spiritual needs as well because we see them at a greater rate. You see what at a greater rate? We see the families. We have interactions with the families at a greater rate than yeah. the average church. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you mentioned that very few families of special needs, uh, special needs children attend church. Uh, why do you think this is? Um, so this was a question we asked everybody that we really encountered. So Abraham might have some feedback on this as well. But I, the main thing that I learned is it's uncomfortable. Um, I think one of the parents specifically said they feel like their child is a burden by the way that they're received in the church or in society as a whole. Like they have to fight for their ch child to be included. And um, just going and being in another place where you're uncomfortable, like why would you want to do that? Like you have to really have a strong buy-in to keep them, to keep going and to keep overcoming that. And so it's really, I think, on the church to reach out and say, we want your child, we want your family, and to give them that buy-in that makes the extra work into going to church seem worth it, unfortunately. Like that feels like a weird way to phrase it, saying church is worth it. But sometimes when your life is so task heavy, then yeah, it's kind of what it boils down to it feels yeah. i think i think that uh when it, this was a big eye opener for me because i remember thinking to myself oh, i've never seen people with this situation or people come up to you know being in church leadership people come up to me and say hey can you help us out with this i was like i never seen people come up and i'm like oh it's because 80 percent of them don't come to church right and and that's why like nobody ever approaches you with the situation as a leader as a church leader because they're just not coming it's not something that they want to do 
um, there's a lot of um, anxiety. There's that's one thing I've I've realized. There's a lot of anxiety. It's if you think you're socially awkward, dude. Like, talk to some of these parents and how they feel. Mm-hmm. Like whatever you 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 thought a level of like I'm talking about my myself. Whatever level of social awkwardness you ever feel you had is, is nothing compared to. To, to being a parent with, you know, with a kid with special needs. Um, and you're just, you feel like you got to apologize. It's just, it's, it, it's just kind of my, my takeaway from, from talking to them. Um, I'd encourage you to go watch, to, to check out the video when it's out, man, because these stories uh, really did, did um, they're really compelling. And they, I don't think they were just there to put you on a guilt trip. I, I honestly, I felt really encouraged coming out of this project. Mm. Um, but yeah, man, that 80% number was like, just let that sink in. That's just yeah. That's, yeah, eighty percent of families with special needs children do not attend church regularly. Yeah, yeah I I was thinking about like um, like some context as well of what it would feel like um, because the again yeah like you, just to echo what you guys are saying the the parents' testimonies are pretty significant uh, but I would imagine it feels like when I take my kids on an airplane. And I'm like hypersensitive because I don't want them to disturb anybody around them. Yeah. And any little thing, I'm like fidgety. And if they were crying when they were little, I would be like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And and just that stress and anxiety, but that would be magnified uh, everywhere you went when, yeah. uh, with a child with special needs. And just just thinking about it in those terms, uh, it's, it's pretty significant. To, uh, and there, I, I they also just hearing the parents' testimony. It, it's, it's not just a special needs ministry that we we need to be better at, but really the adult part of the ministry of the parent part of the ministry is significant too, because there's a lot of weight that they're carrying constantly uh, uh, with all of this. Right. Yeah. The um, there's a such thing as like a caregiver burnout. These parents are lifetime caregivers, as every other parent is, but there's an added stressor on that. And there were studies that show that uh, parents of special needs children actually show a higher rate of PTSD even. Like it affects the parents. So when we're talking about special needs ministry and caring for special needs children, we're actually talking about family ministry and caring for the entire family. And even the parents, but then also the siblings. Um, I imagine there's an added stress. We didn't really get into it in the video series talking about siblings, but there's an added stress on that sibling to help out in the house and just... If you always have to cater what you do around the child with special needs, that one child that doesn't have the special need, the sibling, is going to miss out on things. I was talking to a parent, and she said that her child without the special need had never been to a park because parks don't have wheelchair ramps for the other child. And so it's just things that they miss out on, and we don't often. Yeah. I think also just um, I, I remember um, – working with a a family one time a a few years ago and um, one child one of the siblings had a special need and the his siblings basically for the most part they they were pretty accommodating and and helpful and stuff but um, there were times where they felt like oh I gotta go help my brother oh my brother's acting like this I gotta go like help him or there was sort of like just this kind of sense of like responsibility at that young age and um, you're right I think I think it could cause them to maybe miss out on some things and there can sometimes be some some resentment there and I don't mean that in like a, a bad way but just like um, yeah sometimes it can be hard you know the, the the siblings the whole family is affected the whole family is like working through this you know right it really is a family ministry special needs ministry is a family ministry yeah the 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 feeling uh, when we started this project uh, when I started hearing these stories I feel like I went on a journey because of like I didn't know a lot of this stuff and I'm it's not on my radar um, and all of a sudden, I feel like that feeling of when you're cleaning your house and then you realize you've missed a whole entire room. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a whole area that you haven't really paid attention to. There's a whole part that uh, you've kind of neglected, and 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 it's it's significant and it and it puts it put a burden a little bit on, on myself. Um, and now the good news is that um, it didn't just make me feel guilty, but it also made me feel a sense of love. For these families mm-hmm. uh it didn't make me just like it didn't just you know drone up feelings of anger but it was like love it was this this compassion that's kind of like oh man i need to do a better job you know i need to be more sensitive to these things um and and you know th- it's an unseen it's a huge unseen population that we're just not 
reaching out. And so it's the love of Christ that we gotta we gotta remember. We gotta like, you know, the, the gospel has to be preached out to every tribe and every language, every family. You know, it doesn't matter who they are. And this is part of, you know, the Great Commission for us too. And I was like, oh man, like I don't know. So I check it out. <laughs> yeah, there's a really powerful. Um moment in the video um we got a chance to preview the videos and um uh, one of the parents um speaks out it is overwhelming as a of maybe a topic this is for us because we're yeah. i think we're all kind of a little nervous we don't want to uh, interact with the child and have it be negative or harmful or anything like that but um you know one parent said that it was as simple as um their pastor from the pulpit when they're w- basically the, the the parent's child was um, making some audible noises in church and in the pastor from the pulpit said you know what we love children just out in front of the whole service mm-hmm. and it was just a really powerful yeah. moment it was something as simple as just reassuring the parents that it's okay yeah. um, you know we still love your child we still want you here we still want your child here and it was something as simple as that which I thought was really really powerful um you know I, we talked about how Again, we don't, I, I think we're scared. We almost are paralyzed. We don't, we're scared to, um, we don't want to mess up. We don't want to do something wrong. Um, but, you know, we're part of the Salvation Army and the Salvation Army, as we just talked about, we're in a position to minister to this community. We're in a pretty unique position. Um, just for, for Heather and Abraham, is there maybe um, one thing that, that a core or a um, I don't know, a unit that they can um, do regardless of, of resources or the, their location to take a step towards maybe being a little more inclusive towards um, special needs families? Yeah, uh, there's a few things that actually come to mind for me. Um, and I, like, I was a youth worker at Multiple Corps that had special needs children. At the time, I either didn't understand it or I didn't think it was that big of a deal. I didn't want to like single them out, so I didn't do my best at responding to them. So I get the the feelings or the how overwhelming it can feel not wanting to mess up not wanting to say the wrong thing um but regardless of all of that there's one thing that stands out for me mostly any core can do it regardless of if they have somebody in their core if they're in a rural area um large budget small budget is uh i'm going to call it a youth profile just essentially creating a document or something that gathers information about all of the children. So it's just kind of a a get to know you thing. So if a child walks in the door, give it to them, have their parents fill it out. It gathers information about who they are um, and what their needs are. But it's more than just a special needs kind of um, information gathering. It's like a profile. You, we're um, as a resource with this video, we actually, we've created one and it'll be up on our website. it's to gain information and it's crafted questions in a unique way that allows them to answer without feeling guilt or without singling anybody out. It's something that I think every child in the program can complete where you can find out if that child struggles academically. So in the event that you're trying to get them to do something in troops that you know that they academically in school, they struggle with writing or whatever it is. If they still have um, need reminders to use the restroom if their family's going through a divorce or a trauma of a loss, you could gather that information. If the child um, has noise sensory issues, you could gather that information. So it's not just for families of special needs children, um, it's for everybody and it could benefit the youth worker to talk to the parents, gather this information because then if you see this child struggles with noise or sensory issues, then I can talk to the parent and say, okay, so how do we get around that? How can we help them be as successful as possible in our program knowing this? Because that's what we want. Um, Is is this something that, like, again, if you have, like, an outreach night, like troops night or something that you could send home with the kids and have the parent fill out, even if maybe the parent doesn't attend the core, maybe the parent isn't dropping the kids off, maybe the kids are getting picked up, is this something that could easily be sent home? Right, yeah. So it's just like, it's almost like a permission slip, but it's not getting permission for anything. It's just getting information. It's an information slip uh, where they can give information about the child, their age, mailing address, all that stuff, but also beyond that, what their needs are and an opportunity to respond to them. So yeah, I think it benefits any core and every core has paper and can print this out. And like I said, we've crafted one and we're putting it up on Say Network. So youth workers can just download that quickly, print it out, send it to every core, send it home and yeah. yeah, gather that information. I would say uh, watch these videos. That's the first thing <laughs> you can start off on. Because uh, I think we do a good job of giving you a rundown of, of what 
these disabilities and these special needs are like it's like you know you see somebody who has an injury or has something physically wrong with them you know what not to do and you, you're you're aware of how to treat the person so at least start there and learn that there's different sort of this is this is my journey this is like what i've learned is like there's they're affected every every special need is different and there's a different way to respond to them and there's a different way to to, to get to know the person and so just become aware of what that is. It's not that hard. It's not mm-hmm. that I got it. I understood it. I'm not the sharpest guy, you know? So like, true. <laughs> so you, anybody can figure this out. You, you can, you can just get, you know, just a rundown of what, of what you're, you know, what you're dealing with in ministry. And then the second step is that you get to learn, get to know the families, mm-hmm. get to know who they are and, and, and just, you know, build a relationship with those families. That's, 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 you're, you're equipped to do those things as if you're in ministry, that's something that you know how to do. So, you know, be aware of their of the of what specifically the child is is dealing with and the family's dealing with and then get to know them and mm-hmm. show them a lot of love and a lot of compassion and serve them because that's what ministry is. You're serving, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Being yeah. Flexible. My core did the uh, did that paper that you're talking about. The youth profile. For all the parents. Yep. And uh, as a parent filling that out, it feels like um, that the core youth team is leveling up uh like it's i i appreciate it i felt like all right good we could write down specific things and it's giving them insights and being on the other side of being a youth worker and trying to figure it all out as you go um to be able to have kind of a a broad profile and and what it does it kind of creates a bridge to the parents uh directly because you could say hey you know you Sometimes as a youth worker, you're a little bit nervous because you may have been burned by like, hey, you know, is your son ADHD? And they're like, no. And then you feel awkward and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but when they've already kind of shared information you, that you with you, you could be able to say, all right, let's talk about this further. It's, it, it builds a bridge for that. I think it's a very, very helpful document. Yeah, it's like an icebreaker. It gives you something to yeah, talk about. And the common, yeah. the common interest is the child and their success in the core. And their ability to function, yeah. Um, as you guys worked on this project, uh, did you guys come across uh, some core uh, around the territory that uh, have really kind of targeted special needs ministries, maybe done like a small project or a larger project? Um, yeah, I think we we found multiple core who were changing the culture um, of the core in different ways. So we found core that were kind of trying to, I guess, break traditional church rules, allowed talk back during the service to be able to welcome any noise or outbursts or things like that and not necessarily dismiss the children from the church if they're, or from the main church service if they were making noise. Um, I found a core also that was doing, um, that had sensory things when you came into the chapel, things that included um, noise-canceling headphones. I think they were like drummer headphones, special ones. So that way, if like the time that the brass band came on or the praise and worship, if it got too loud, these children could put these headphones on. And so that way they weren't overwhelmed with the noise. Um, Or they also offered earbuds so they can pop some earbuds in if they wanted to be a little bit more discreet and not be singled out. Um, But then they also gave those fidget spinner things. You just had to like drop off a like something of yours, like kind of an exchange program. So, but it was cool that they were thinking of that. They wanted the children to be able to function in the church setting. Another example is there's a a core that noticed that there were some children that were on the spectrum at their core that were struggling to participate in their troop programs. And so they created their own, another troop called Trekkers. And it was for boys and girls. And they were able to modify emblem work that um, the children were able to complete. And so they still were able to do the troop program and move at their own pace and do the things that they were able to do and celebrate those victories. And so they were still able to have uniforms and things like that. They modified the uniform even sometimes if, for example, the sash was something that maybe felt overwhelming for them. They were able to do that. And yeah, they just had a fifth troop really, or I guess a sixth troop where they did that for specifically children that weren't able to function in the regular explorers or sunbeam program. And it was fantastic seeing that. Um, And then another one that I found out about that I think is wonderful is uh, the Fannings, Captain Fanning up in uh, Kenai, Alaska. They once again noticed that that they had some children on the spectrum coming to their program. And when it came a certain time during the lessons, the children would really struggle and it was distracting. 
And so they actually worked with their teen group, had them paint a wall in the classroom, and they made it the wiggle wall. So if a child needed to stand up and move and func- like get out of their seat and not sit in a typical classroom setting, they were permitted to go to the wiggle wall, and the only rule was that you could not make noise. So you could move all you wanted, you could drive cars on the wall, but you weren't able to make noise. And so eventually they recognized that some of the kids that weren't needing the wall necessarily, they liked the novelty of it, they would go. That was totally fine. They just couldn't make noise. It was the same rule. Eventually the novelty wore off and the children who actually needed the wall were the ones that were able to go to it, have their needs met and function how they could, and then be able to return. And it was fantastic. It was a way that they were still included in the Sunday school or small group time. And it was fantastic. I love that idea. I was um, emailing with Captain Fanning and she told me the story and just she said a few things that really just stood out to me because after she told me the story of it, um, she said that the boy, one of the boys, uh, him and his mom still attend the core. The mom is involved in home league and other Bible study groups. And she said they are a wonderful family and have fully um, jumped into our core and they're a joy. Like, that's, it goes back to kind of what we were saying yeah. at the beginning. By them making that one adjustment, just painting that wall, allowing kids to move rather than forcing them to sit in the chair and fun- like behave, essentially, they were able to keep that family and essentially win that family for Christ. And that's our goal, right? To be able to keep them in a space where we can teach them the gospel, develop relationships. And so kudos to Captains Fanning and the Kenai Corps for that and the teen group. I like that they were able to build not just a relationship with the child, but also with the parent, you know, Mm -hmm. now the family is like coming. Yeah. It's fantastic. That's great. Um, So we talked about um, the video series a little bit. Um, It's not quite out yet, but it will be out soon. Um, When when people watch this series, um, what can they expect from the series? I think the first thing they can expect is the reality or realness, rawness of what it is to have a special needs family and they can expect to learn a lot i mean i sat down with each of these families before we even filmed and i thought i understood it when i just chatted with them but then even when watching the videos i'm like blown away by the amount of information that's out there that maybe i misunderstood and kind of correcting that yeah um i think you're gonna I think there's going to be, a, at least for me, my experience, there's going to be a new part of you that's going to that's going to open up a little bit, you know, uh, and you're, you're going to grow, you know, you're going to grow uh, in your ministry, I think. Like if, if, if ministry and, and youth ministry is your passion, um, this this can only help you more. And it's going to, I feel like, you know, that's, that was my experience through all this. I felt like I've grown. I felt like... Um, um, you know, like I've, I've, um, become more aware of, of, of people's lives, you know, and I, it's made me care a lot more, you know? Um, yeah, like uh, there's, there's situations now when, when, you know, my, my daughter or in school with kids who have special needs, there's, there's situations now that I've become more sensitive towards. We literally were just talking about one yeah. earlier. <laughs> yeah. I've become just more like sensitive and, and try to see the other side and try to try to be put yourselves in the parents shoes like it's 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 created a lot of empathy and I think that's what what this is going to do to a lot of people I think it's going to give you a lot more empathy I think it's going to um, open up your heart you know I think that's what's going to have your heart's mm-hmm. going to grow a, a little bit more and it's nothing but but good things is, is what I think I didn't we weren't trying to put you on a guilt trip we're not mm-hmm. trying to to make you that's not going to produce anything anyways that that the bible even says that 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 kind of repentance doesn't lead to anything uh but this is more about trying to make your heart grow and make you love more um and so i, I i'm really excited for for you know for people who are going to watch these i'm excited for for you know what's what's what this is going to lead to um but yeah there's also, I, I, I feel like just in previewing um, them, there was a lot of practical information in there. Yeah. You guys gave mm-hmm. some just real simple kind of like takeaways that, you know, any youth leader or any core officer can can work to implement. Um, and they, right. they were simple things. And I appreciate that you guys really went in with that mindset of how could we do this in a core setting? Um, because those are our front lines. Those are where, like yeah. you said, most of these families are coming in through social services and, mm-hmm. and through our outreach programs. So I, I really appreciated that you guys took that angle. And um, 
uh, yeah, again, Abraham, I just um, resonate with what you said. It, just the the courage of the 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 people who spoke out on the video, to yeah. it, being willing to share their story of 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 their their situation or their child's situation. Um, it, it's really compelling. It's really moving, and um, yeah, just so much respect for for that whole thing. Um, I think it's safe to say that you know we're not. We haven't mastered the special no. needs stuff. We're just barely no. getting into it. Just, uh, you know, in the Salvation Army, if you're a youth worker, you've probably worked with kids with special needs or been working with kids with special needs. But as a, as a whole, I think it's something that um, we're in that, that process of awareness. We're trying to learn. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Heather, maybe you can speak more to um, Chris, uh, Captain Christina Arnold, but um, she, she recently was appointed as a special needs spe specialist. <laughs> yeah. She's the director of special needs ministry in, for the territory. Yeah, um, she was actually somebody that I, somebody told me, reach out to Captain Christina Arnold. She knows about special needs ministry. And so she was the one of the first ones that I went to and went to glean information from. I'm like, okay, what do I need to know? What do we as a Salvation Army need to know? And how can we do better? Because 80%, that is a weighty number. 80% not attending church of anything is yeah, flabbergasting. Like, it's a lot. Um, but she gave, and I hope this series gives hope. And so talking to her, you could see her expertise and her knowledge, uh, her empathy, and her desire to also really impact the 80%. So when Moose came out and they made that appointment, she... Yeah. I was fantastic. That's such just, a good fit. Just, and we actually had to re-record stuff, too. Yeah. I just keep thinking that, like, if we found out there was a country where 80% of the country did not hear the gospel, we would be flying missionaries out there like, right. like, it, like you know, like crazy. We would be dropping Bibles from airplanes, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is one that's right here in our home. There's, yep. a, there's, there's a whole, yeah, so. Yeah, there's millions of people in the United States alone that don't have special, or that have special needs. Yeah. And so 80% of millions? yeah. That's yeah, a huge number, and 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 yeah, like the 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 context is 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 their interactions with the church and how how their their stories are, and and yeah, so there was a lot of brave. They was they were so brave and they were so awesome to 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 help us out in this whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, I mean, I think yeah, like I say, it, it's safe to say we're 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 learning. We're in that learning phase, but there's um you know as we learn, we we are able to um put more resources out there. So this is just kind of, hopefully it's just a starting point, you know, this video series, and then also um, having Captain Christina as a resource for the field as well for um, for special needs. But I agree with you, if, if there's anything we can do for this population, like, I, let's do it. Especially, it seems like these are simple things. I mean, these, these aren't terribly difficult things. And, you know, I, I speak for myself too. I get, when I'm around somebody with special needs, I, I immediately just, I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? You know, but um, just being able to break through that and realizing that, you know what, it's, it's not that difficult. It could be as simple as just saying hello or just having mm -hmm. a conversation, even just with their parent, even yeah, um, asking questions. Exactly. It's as simple, as simple as that. And so, um, yeah, hopefully we can be bold enough to, to kind of, you know, step through some of those barriers and, and be more inclusive to, to our um, our special needs community. Right. Well, I just wanna say thank you, uh, Heather, for being here. Um, as we said before, the special needs video series, it'll be available on sayconnect.com very, very soon. We're, we're hoping within the next um, few weeks that it will be out and available. We'll um, continue to post updates on our social media about when, when the release date for those videos are. But if you have specific questions about working with special needs families, um, feel free to reach out to us or also to Captain Christina as well. Um, she's a great resource. And uh, you can always send us a message on social media at Say Network, or you can email us at sayconnect at gmail.com. Anything we've talked about in this episode will be linked in the show notes. And also don't forget to subscribe to the Say Network podcast on Apple or Spotify for updates on new episodes. YouTube. Yes. <laughs> and we are also on YouTube. Um, we just want to say thank you guys for listening. Um, this has been really a lot of fun. We've had a lot of really great feedback from season two, and we're already getting ready to start brainstorming ideas for season three. We've had some really great um, suggestions coming our way. Special thank you to um, Major Lynn Stewart and to Lieutenant uh, Cassandra Amiskita for your suggestions. Uh, I do appreciate those. And um, yeah, if you have ideas or guests that you'd like to hear hear from in season three, please, please send them our way. Um, thank you for listening. And yeah, we'll be back soon with season three.